I was just desperately Googling away what everything meant. I think I couldn't even pick one. It was just another language when I first joined. And now I speak fluent acronyms. How do you become a massive success in mobile marketing? Welcome to Mobile Heroes Uncensored, episode 20. My name is John Kutzier and my co-host is Peggy Ann Saltz. And today we are chatting with Jade Warbeck, who leads performance marketing at The Meet Group, and Katie Gill, head of marketing at Dressed. Our topic is growth and not for your app, but for you. How do you blast up the career ladder and level up to the top jobs? We start by chatting about some mobile news, consolidation in ad tech, what a shock. And we end by highlighting some of the mobile heroes that we're talking about in Mobile Heroes Uncensored. And just maybe there's a couple of horrible, awful dad jokes along the way. So Peggy, you've got some news for us to chat about. Absolutely. And this is the kind of news that we've been hearing so much about, John. It's another one for us, right? In Moby acquires AppSumer, another one. Everybody's acquiring everybody, right? We had $7 billion acquisitions in mobile ad tech in the first quarter of this year. Now we've got another, it's probably not a billion dollar deal, but in terms weren't released, but it is another sort of ad network monetization platform buying a marketing measurement company. Of course, we know about AppLovin and Adjust. Now Moby has bought AppSumer and guess what? The reason is more first party data. I talked to Navin Madhavan, who's the VP and GM for growth marketing solutions for Imobi. And he said, in the absence of device identifiers like IDFA, marketing data is just more complex, more difficult to understand, creates more nuances, inconsistencies. Given those changes, we have to bring more data together into a single platform, make it easier for developers. So that's the same old story, right, Peggy? Same old story. I just wonder sometimes, is it really putting marketers at ease to know that all this data is coming together on one platform. I don't know. Do you look, Katie and uh, Jay, do you feel particularly, um, yeah, uh, confident and at ease? <laughs> well, I'm coming from this from, as a client of AppSumer actually. So I will be interested to see what the, the changes are coming down the pike. Um, yeah, it's an interesting trend. And we've seen it before, as you mentioned, with consolidation. So, yeah, we'll be. Thinking. That's really interesting. That's really interesting to hear that you are a customer right now. I mean, did you get forewarning of this? Did they let you know? Or is this, you know, you're first hearing about it today? No. So I did get an email from the CEO earlier today. So I did know about it before, but I wouldn't say that we were forewarned at all. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Katie, what are your thoughts here? I, I think similar to what you said, this sense of convergence seems to be pervading throughout the industry. We've seen so many mergers and acquisitions thus far, and I think it's just everyone's having to think more creatively um, with the deprecation of IDFA. Do you know what, Peggy? Yes. We jumped right into the news, and I didn't share any jokes. Well, my cat tried, but no. Your cat tried. <laughs> Your cat tried it, and, and we thank your cat for that. But I have a couple dad jokes for you. you oh, I love them. Go ahead. You do, you do. Okay. Bring them all over to the line. Do it. Hardcore, 100% dad jokes, right? Why, Peggy, do plants hate math? Um, it's got to be something about multiplying. No, it is not. They hate square roots. <laughs> they hate square roots. Where do you get these children? Oh, it cannot be revealed. I have another one for you. Okay. I'm never <laughs> laughing too much either, by the way. So it's a yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know. Here, this this one uh, might be a little controversial. I don't know. It depends if you're scientific or not. We'll see. How, Peggy, do flat earthers travel? Not at all. Sideways. I don't know. <laughs> Beam me up. I don't know, Don. They travel on a plane. He's not reading these anywhere. He's to down. <laughs> but we have more to talk about, I believe. And actually, we have some very interesting people to talk about it with. Peggy, who are we chatting with today? 
We started already, but here's the formal, formal introduction. And maybe you want to wave or say hi when I do call you out. So we'll start with you, Jade. Jade, Head of Performance Marketing at the Meet Group. So Jade focuses on driving global user growth for Meet Me, Scout, Tagged. Those are part of the Meet Group. She's also a true cosmopolitan, John. She's lived in Thailand, Hong Kong, and the U.S. Nice. That was in her DNA. Books were a big part of her personal reset during COVID. And right now, rock climbing is her latest passion. Her pet peeve, probably for all of us, is a poorly executed email campaign. <laughs> Who doesn't love irrelevant email? And uh, her colleagues say that she's the perfect mix of eloquence, professionalism, and playfulness. So she's a great fit for our show, where we, of course, mix business and pleasure, John. Wow, that is impressive. Jade, tell us one fun fact about yourself. Oh, fun fact. Uh, well, I guess to go back to the travel thing, um, I actually went to three different middle schools. So, which is crazy considering how short of a time middle school is. Um, so a lot of those middle schools were in Thailand, Hong Kong, and the U S but yeah, also live in the Philippines and in multiple cities in the, in the U S. <laughs> wow. Impressive. And we have Katie Gill. She's from Dressed, which I love because it is about dressed and dressing and fashion with D-E-R-E-S-T. So a little play on words there. <laughs> Katie has taken the path less travel. We'll stay with travel for the moment, right? Her life really shows it. No less than three pivots so far. So she entered the fashion industry by Netta Porter. Then she discovered she loved advertising. From there, she moved to the publisher side with Condé Nast International before changing industries a third time to gaming at Dress, which is a mobile game and e-commerce platform that lets you sort of take style challenges using luxury brands and looks. And speaking of challenges, Katie takes them in stride. Her colleagues call her, and I quote, a highly organized and always solution-focused person. Little known talent, John, and you bet Bet you can't beat this one. She can recite a good part of the periodic table by heart. Wow. Uh, should we ask for it? <laughs> me to now. I didn't realize I could do it until I was in this crystal maze challenge in London and suddenly it came to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Tell us what part of your job, I have a feeling I know because there's a thread that runs through all your jobs, but what part of your job are you most passionate about? Um, what part am I? I'm, I'm just incredibly passionate about learning as cliche as it sounds. I've loved picking up different skills at all of the different roles that I've held thus far. I think fashion has been a, a kind of constant tenet, which I adore. Um, but it really has just all been born out of the drive to keep learning and keep growing. Love it. Love it. Love it. And I learned, you know, just recently that dressed is not a town in Germany. <laughs> 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 <Not> <laughs> <laughs> learning <laughs> continues forever well oh, well welcome <laughs> to mobile heroes uncensored so peggy and i do a side mobile heroes uncensored which we call origin stories this is kind of a mega origin stories episode what we want to chat about is how you got started in user acquisition and maybe some of the growth points along the way jade let's start with you what was your first job my first job uh was at a biosensor startup where I wore many hats, as you do at a startup. And I, my responsibilities included social media management, event planning, uh, including for industry events like uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Um, but I think what is great about startup life at, at an entry-level job is um, just being able to learn very quickly and grow quickly as a result of that. And if the environment is flexible, also being able to explore interests. So that was my first exposure to paid social, uh, which is how I was able to pivot into mobile marketing for, for Scout. As you moved from role to role and, and moved up the ladder as well, how did you kind of level up as you moved from different challenge to the next? 
Yeah. Uh, so my first role at, at Scout, um, which was the first kind of digital marketing specific role that I did was at influencer marketing. Uh, and my favorite part of that was just the more data driven piece. So looking at organic uplift or estimating CPI or thinking about what other measurable results can we get from this campaign. And that translated very nicely into user acquisition and more performance driven marketing. So I think just expressing that interest um, to my manager at the time, um, wanting to combine the data driven piece with creativity as part of my career path, uh, really, I I'm grateful to that manager for recognizing that and then guiding me towards a more performance role. So yeah, like leveling up from there, um, just taking on more and more responsibility was, was really great. So many gems in there, right? I mean, cause obviously there's such a, a mix in marketing, especially mobile marketing between the data and the creativity, but also telling your manager, telling your boss, I'm interested in something else. I want to do more. I want just having so that they have that in the back of their minds when they're thinking about the challenges that they're facing and the openings that might come up is really important. There's so many people who want the next level, but maybe never dare to express it um, and never get it. So that was really, really awesome. Uh, if you had one tip for others coming up the career ladder, what would it be? I would say, um, be proactive and advocate for yourself. I think uh, early on in my career, it was very heads down, doing doing the work, do a good job, the metrics will speak for themselves. And uh, it might be difficult to, to hear, but not everyone is thinking about you all the time. <laughs> and so, so just learning that you, you should create that visibility for yourself, really. And uh, as a reminder of the value that you bring to the team, um, it, that will help you level up. And that's a real skill too, hey? Learning to bring visibility to what you do and what you offer without doing it in the wrong way, <laughs> without looking me, 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 me. And I, there's a real skill to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I would say so. I think... Um, I think another tip too for uh, somebody who may just be starting out and wants to level up is is creating goals. So that is a good way to just you know sit down with your manager, create these short term, long term goals where you say, okay, well, I, I'd like to achieve this. This is where I I see myself. Um, this is what I would like to go in my career. And when you achieve those goals, you can point back to them and be like, okay, well, I'm already operating at this, this level. Um, and that's a good way to achieve that recognition, um, without being like me, me, me all the time. Cause you've already established those, um, in advance. Love it. Okay. Katie, over to you. I mean, it's exciting because you're at that sweet spot, you know, gaming, fashion, commerce, <laughs> um, advertising marketing, it's all together there. If there's anyone who's done it, you've done it, but how did it happen? How did you get to the center of all that excitement? You know, the advertising, the market and the fashion, fashion's very cool. I mean, you make it just sound utterly wonderful, which of course it is. Um, but yeah, as you say, I've had, a, I've had a rather kind of unique, I guess, career trajectory thus far. Um, but I, I think I said this at the beginning, my motivation has really just been trying to keep learning and remaining curious. And it's really all stemmed from there. So. At university, I studied nothing to do with any of this. I did languages. Um, and then I entered the fashion industry at Net de Porte. I obviously loved advertising, scaled their advertising program. And as part of that, um, that involved working with Condé Nast International. So over I went, published a site um, to learn something new. Um, and I worked across their entire brand portfolio at CNI on a global scale. Um, but whilst I was there, I heard um, through word of mouth about Dressed. It was operating very secretively at the time. So I actually... DM'd on Instagram, our now um, chief operating officer, to meet up and to find out more. Um, so to, similar to what Jade was saying, just about being proactive and putting yourself out there. 
I um, was completely won over when I met with her about this concept of gamifying the styling experience. And I, I signed it up there and then. So I really do think it is, a lot of it is about being proactive and being brave and saying yes. Um, and you, in doing that, I guess, can, can mold these many pivots into something that resembles a relatively thought out career trajectory as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Love that <kind of> point. <laughs> it's all planned. It's all planned. I'm going to stay with that because the pivots, I mean, three of them. There was a time when, you know, you switch jobs too frequently and it might not be a great thing, but that's not the case anymore. You know, move fast. And that's exactly what you've done. But what have you learned by moving fast? Again, you know, those three pivots, what are some lessons you can share? I think actually probably if I picked out the most important things that I've learned, it's been the stuff that's come up consistently irrespective of the industry. And that's why you know it must be good. Um, so I guess really generally, I've just learned the, the massive importance of a customer-centric approach. It doesn't matter if you're in fashion or publishing or gaming or whatever. It is really the customer that you're ultimately working for. So you need to give them the most memorable and meaningful experience to keep them coming back. Um, but more generally, I guess I've, I've learned the importance of asking questions and taking risks. I think it just puts you in the right mindset to stay full of ideas and keep empowered and keep moving and gives you the sense of agility within your job as well. And then finally, I, I guess a sense of collaboration. It's so important to collaborate with stakeholders, um, irrespective of their department and their discipline. Um, my colleagues and, and my wider network, I'm really lucky, um, fill me with information ideas constantly. And I think if you can start networking early on, it'll set you in the, boss, in the best possible way and to start growing from the outset. Mm -hmm. So networking, that connecting, we'll think of you as the great connector, Katie. It sounds as you said, sorry, it sounds like it's all planned, you know, all the pivots, it all makes sense. Um, but then was it really that way? It sounds like it was just a smooth arc, a smooth transition, one to the next to the next. Or have you hit your share of dead ends as well in your career? Yeah, I think it's one of those classic things where you look back with hindsight and you go, what a wonderful linear narrative I've woven myself. Um, but obviously in practice, of course, it's, it's not like that at all. Like I can make it certainly appear that way, but I've absolutely hit like that share of, of dead ends that didn't quite plan out, uh, pan out, sorry, as planned. But I think rather than thinking of them as dead ends, if you can try and reposition it as more of a redirection, it, it opens up new possibilities that you might not have thought about previously. So I would, I'd kind of advocate for worrying less about the smooth curve pursuit and, and more just about building your skill set through putting yourself out there and, and keeping pushing to learn more. I have to I, ask, uh, go, go, go ahead, John. I can't say how much I love that point um, because I, I think that the very best people in any industry often have these crazily chaotic career arcs where you can make it make sense in retrospect, <laughs> but as you're going through it, you have no clue. And sometimes you can get really down and really depressed. Like, why did I do this? Why did I take that job? Why did I go on that opportunity? And somehow, magically, in the end, it all works out to have given you some level of experience that you find useful later on. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is really up to you to make the most of the opportunities out there. And most of the time, there aren't any wrong decisions. It's just about making it work for you, I think. I have to ask though, you know, because there's that feeling that, yes, this is just trying something new out and it's just going to take a while. Or there's like, yeah, this really is a rut. Um, what <laughs> tells you when you're, in a, when you're in a dead end? You know, when, because if you think about it, when do you really have to move on? I'm just curious because we've done it. Sometimes they tell you, Peggy. <laughs> you can, you can, <laughs> that's your big learning ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's, it's where I start turning up at work every day and I know pretty much how the day is going to pan out. Mm. And if I know, almost exactly or can predict how most days will pan out, I start to think I'm probably not trying hard enough here. I'm not pushing myself in the way that you probably should if you want to stay excited and engaged. So I, I think it's just in the morning, just having a look at your day and if there's nothing unexpected in there or if nothing happens during the day that's remotely unexpected, I think it's, it might be worth sticking your head above water than having a look around. Oh, interesting, interesting. So that's sort of like, don't get comfortable. Um, I like it. Something I heard once. Like, like, yeah, it's that. Yeah. 
Netflix? No, okay. exactly that. I think if you end up sort of sitting in the room where you feel entirely comfortable, you're potentially not in the right room. It's that classic saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's think for a moment. Imagine you can go back to your younger self and you can give your younger self, you know, Katie, here's some career advice that you're going to find really valuable. What would you tell your younger Katie? I think as cliche as it sounds, probably just have more confidence. Um, because of course that, that confidence comes really naturally over time and with more experience. But I think at the start of your career, you're often feeling your least confident because you just think, I don't know anything and I have no idea how to make any of this work, but actually you're kind of paradoxically in the best position to say yes to everything and just be brave and get involved. So if it's learning a new skill from scratch or taking on more responsibility or just, I mean, even on LinkedIn, you can just reach out to anyone you admire and message them. And just see what happens because you'll learn faster that way and you'll be a more valuable team member. I just think you go further if you can put your hand up and get involved. Love it. Love it. Excellent. Cool. So we don't just work here. We also have some fun at Mobile Heroes Uncensored. And this is the game we're going to play Eternal Rookie, uh, which is really quite, you know, apropos of our topic today. Eternal Rookie is the game where you can, well, first of all, satisfy Peggy's insatiable thirst for embarrassing other people, but secondly, win an invisible Bitcoin from her stash of thousands of them. All of us find as we go through our careers that we have just unexplainable gaps, right? Those things that Katie, as a rookie, you can ask a question, but as the senior important VP of everything, you simply can't reveal that you don't know. So. It's obvious stuff that we should know. We just missed. Question is this, what's the most obvious thing about mold marketing that you did not know for ages? And Katie, you are the first victim. Oh no, gosh. I mean, I've learned so much even this year, given all the huge shifts. I think for me, it's, I, I mean, when I first joined Dress, honestly, it was like learning another language. I still have in one of my notebooks next to me, I've got this huge kind of glossary of acronyms. Um, but that I had to write out with what all of it meant. <laughs> I'm still getting this, another language for me. Brilliant. Um, so I, I did spend my first few kind of weeks in meetings thinking, gosh, there's pushing yourself. And then there's pushing yourself. I was just desperately Googling away what everything meant. I think I couldn't even pick one. It was just another language when I first joined. And now I speak fluent acronyms. So I'm very happy on that front. <laughs> <laughs> now you're a member of the club. You know all the well, jargon. Exactly. And everybody else in the team is like, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> I love it. I don't know. Really, fluent acronym is, is a great way to describe it, right? John, I speak, I speak fluent acronym. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But it's different for every vertical. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, challenging thing. <laughs> What's your answer for this? What was the sort of one thing, key thing that you should have known about mobile marketing, but you didn't know for ages? Yeah, I, I mean, I would have to agree with Katie. I think that acronyms take a while to really get under your belt. And it, if I were to go back to young Jade and read some of the emails that I send now, I would just feel like, what is, what is this job? What is she doing? <laughs> okay. um, but I think, yeah, I think all of us have had to learn a lot very quickly, just even in the past year with all of the, the changes from Apple. Um, I'm not even sure if I st still understand it 100% with, with everything with conversion timers and uh, MSKI network. And I think we're kind of going with the flow a little bit, um, waiting to hear if there are any other updates. Uh, but I do think that that, that is something that we've had to learn very quickly. Absolutely. And Jade, let me just put you at ease. Uh, you don't have to keep waiting. There will be other changes. <laughs> they, they will just keep coming and they won't stop. We'll eventually get something from Google as well. And then yeah. uh, it'll be a little softer, but yeah, <laughs> you are not alone in that bucket. There are many, um, and it is complicated and is challenging. Peggy, who wins, who wins the Bitcoin? I think they're both sort of equally um, challenge the approach. However, <laughs> it's a bit of a tie. However, I do have to say that I love the thought of like Katie Googling, you know, frantically with no one to maybe find out maybe under the table or something. What are they talking about? So I'm happy to say more sort of like 
for sort of handling, um, you know, real time, real time anxiety, I'd have to give it to her. <laughs> Great game. And back to work. So these questions are open to all. We'll probably kick it to one side or the other to start, but everybody can chime in. Um, and I'll kick it off and Peggy and I will uh, swap places here. What's your advice to the mobile marketer or the user acquisition specialist who wants to level up, but is having a really hard time breaking out of a role or a niche that they're in? Uh, Jade, maybe let's kick that off to you first. Hmm. I, I would have to go back to, to taking initiative, um, always being hungry and, and jumping on opportunities to learn. As we just discussed, this, this industry is really fast paced and it's changing all the time. And your job now isn't going to be the same as your job in a few years. So whether it be in terms of getting noticed by the team or for your efforts, maybe uh, diving deep into the data and covering an insight that may have been overlooked um, or creating a new report that is going to save the rest of the team a bunch of time, those kinds of things. Um, even if it's outside of your job description, uh, they will get recognized and make you stand out. Hmm. Anything to add, Katie? I completely agree. I think if, if you're talking within the same business, you need to make a stance for why you want to learn what you want to learn and, and make it as easy as possible for your mentor or identifying some kind of insight that hasn't been focused on previously. Um, I think outside of your business, this though it's it's often really helpful to find a mentor so someone who is in or has held a kind of similar position or a similar as is you know working in something that is similar to what you're interested in and maybe talking through next steps with them because you can then benefit from their experience but also potentially identify um kind of career goals you might have had that you, you weren't aware of previously i like that i like the idea of sort of pointing out something that you could do better and then doing it and then showing it, that makes a lot of sense. Now you're both in leadership positions. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about the mindset shift that people need to make when they're switching from making that individual contribution and picking out that one thing that you wanted to fix, for example, and show to the team to level up to moving to management. Um, I'll ask you, Jade, I'll start with you, Jade. What would you say is the biggest mindset shift? Yeah. Uh... I think as an individual contributor, you are very focused on how you can do your best work. And when you shift into leadership and management, you have to learn how to create an environment for others to do their best work. So your success um, and your control over your own success is, is not, I'm, I wouldn't say not as important, but if other successes are your success, you know, I get what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. It's about cultivating that. So the mindset is not thinking about your own success. It's like, how do I help everyone succeed so that ultimately I do too, because you're in a management position. <laughs> it ain't. Yeah. So removing obstacles so that a direct report can flourish on their own. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, that cultivating, what's it for you, Katie? What can you add? I, I think it's empathy fundamentally. It's, it's exactly what Jay describes. So you're moving from thinking about like kind of yourself, what you need to achieve, what you contribute to the business to then what your team needs to achieve and contributes to the business. So you need to think of and listen to others. And if you can do that, I think both on a personal level and a professional one, you'll absolutely get the most out of your team and you'll drive results as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting question and such great answers that you guys are given there. It's, it's always a challenge for me because uh, frankly, I'm passionate about what I do and I love what I do and I like to focus on that. And I've managed people in teams of 15, 20 or whatever. And it's just not something that I love, <laughs> but you have to love that and creating that environment where others can succeed. 
I mean, I coach lots of sports and I enjoy that when those kids do well, but yeah, it's just different. Great answers there and glad that there are wonderful people who are willing to step up and take those management roles. Talking about that, there are a lot more women in growth now than there used to be, but probably not as many as we need. Any thoughts on that? How do we fix that? I can jump in. <laughs> uh, I think the most important thing is visibility. Uh, it's been said over and over again, but you, you can't be when you can't see. And so if women see other women in growth, then they will know that it's a viable career option. Uh, and likewise, if women see other women in leadership roles, then they can be inspired to achieve the same. Uh, I remember going to growth conferences at the beginning of my career where there were very few women speakers. <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't because there were women working in growth at the time. I think maybe they might not have thought that they belonged on the stage. Uh, and I think there's been so much change in the past few years and that's been really great. And that's come as a result of uh, a continued push for inclusion and gender diversity and we're heading in the right direction. Nice. Katie, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I think on the on the development side, absolutely profiling senior female leaders within organizations just makes for these like tangible examples of, of what you can achieve, as Jade says. Um, and then I think on the retention side, obviously, you know, equity in terms of pay and progression just goes without saying. But I also think that there are there are certainly practices that you can implement, policies that you can implement that really foster a more inclusive and representative working place. So particularly flexible working in the light of the pandemic and its effect on women's employment, I think it's incredibly important right now. So I want to look at, again, your personal growth. We were talking about, you know, women in growth and, you know, and helping them up that ladder, helping them giving a, a you know, a way to get up a rung by, by maybe just seeing you on the show, to be honest, right? But you with your personal growth, what do you think is better when you're trying to progress in your career? Should you be patient or you should be impatient? I'll ask you, Jade. Cool. I actually think it's a bit of both. You, you need both. Uh, you have to be patient to put in the work so that you're ready for that next level in your career that you're, and put in the work to learn. Uh, but you also need a little bit of impatience to seize opportunities when they present themselves and also creating those opp opportunities for yourself. Um, but then you can't see those opportunities unless you've actually done the groundwork, which takes patience. So a bit of both. Okay, a little bit of both. How about you, Katie? Is it such a balance or is there a dead winner? Did you hear that, Katie? I did. The question. Sorry, just cut out for Bill Bear. <laughs> they had no the response there. I think I've got you back. Perfect. Um, no, I, I completely agree. I think it's about balancing the two at different sort of stages of progression within your career because whilst patience, I guess, is traditionally thought of as really passive and static, I think actually in the right sort of setting, it can put you, so the, single you out even as, um, as an active and, and effective skill and really professional and reliable um as long as you're not using it as an excuse for indecision obviously um but impatience is bad for you, I think. <laughs> so you know i'm being patient you know <laughs> <I'm being> patient. <laughs> impatience can be often um, is associated with like dynamism and innovation and that side of things um but if you come across as remotely like reckless or impulsive as, as jade said without having done the groundwork first um i think that that's not such a good look um, but focusing on its more positive traits like ambition and drive, I think that's that's only a good thing. So that's how you progress in your own careers, and that's maybe the you know the rule of thumb for that. I'd love to think about marketing overall because you both said it is changing all the time, has changed tremendously in the last year, maybe the most challenging it's ever been. How do you see it progressing, evolving over the next five years? I'll start with you, Katie. Um, 
I think it's sort of at the beginning when we were talking about news stories, we obviously mentioned this, but with the deprecation of IDFA, I think everyone is having to become more sophisticated in their thinking around the customer life cycle. And so as opposed to growth marketing being reliant on acquiring new users as it was previously, I think we need to get more sophisticated about how we're how we're acquiring and and then better managing existing users. So it's kind of a shift from evaluating campaign performance solely on hitting certain acquisition goals to instead sort of taking more holistic view um, and looking at at retaining users and then growing that retained unit base as as a contribution of overall revenue. Um, And for me, that's just convergence. So it's forming task forces within your business, um, not just with the UA team, not just for the product team, not just with data science, but everyone working together to kind of model and measure uh, the impact of any campaigns you run holistically. And because of that, you'll avoid kind of siloing any insights and also promote kind of new and more innovative ways of thinking that that I guess should only benefit business as a whole. So I've seen a lot of talk recently about bringing decision engines in-house, for example, and potentially that'll become increasingly common to, to manage these users in a more sophisticated manner in the light of these recent changes. It's very, very interesting because we're talking, we're getting right back again to holistic and cultivating and bringing things together and moving things forward. Jane, what do you have to add to that, Jade? Yeah, I I completely agree with Katie. I think that the past year has uh, made a lot of marketing teams think about how to really look at, at the data. We got used to looking at things very granularly. And then that's gone, that's kind of gone away and, and now more maybe now on a blended basis, um, more cross collaboration with, uh, data science and engineering. Um, but I think another way to switch gears for a little bit, uh, that things may change in the next five years is, which we've already started to see, um, is personalization. So um, that can come from the, the whole customer journey. So personalized, more personalized ads. Um, you're already starting to see that with Apple's announcement with custom product pages, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and then just being able to show different features or yeah, to show different app features um, to different segments of your target audience is really important. And I'm glad that they're, they're finally doing that. Very nice. Custom product pages are exciting a lot of different people because you can look at different segments in your user base and your customer base and say, hey, I've got one for that person and one for that person and maybe even custom onboarding flows for them. We'll get into that a little later, maybe on another show. Uh, As you're hiring, um, I don't even know if you look at resumes anymore. That's the first question, I guess. But the second question is, when you see a resume, if you're looking at resumes, What's a total non-starter, no-go red flag on a resume? And Katie, let's start with you. I think you normally tend to find it out when you actually bring candidates into interview. But if anyone has lied on their CV, it just becomes so clear. It's such a no for me because I completely get this drive. You want to kind of big up what you have achieved, but it becomes so very obvious when you're talking to someone if they don't really know. And actually for me, because I have pivoted several times, I have no problem at all with people needing to learn skills from scratch. Absolutely none. I'm in fact impressed that you're here and that you want to try. And if you have an attitude and and the right kind of attitude to do that, then great. But not if you've lied about it beforehand. (laughs) So it's more of an interpersonal one for me. Same question, Jade. What's a total non-starter no-go on a resume? No, it's, it's the same. It's the same for me. I think... If you have very obviously exaggerated, um, I think, yeah, even just really, really exaggerating something that you have done, um, and then you don't have knowledge about that when asked, um, it is, it's a major red flag. I guess we can't describe the show as a partnership or collaboration with the meat group and dressed, um, Peggy. So (laughs) I guess that's out uh, so much for our big marketing plans here. (laughs) Uh, Name dropping here, John. We can't do it. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. Almost at the end, last hits, last question. Uh, we'll start with Katie on this one as well. Uh, as people are looking to move up the career ladder in growth in mobile user acquisition, mobile advertising, mobile marketing, what is the one skill they really, really need? 
Katie, you first. So um, I think it probably less a skill and more a mindset, um, but basically just like get comfortable with change. It's coming. There's nothing you can do. Everything is evolving all the time. Um, and the world is only becoming more privacy centric. So I think those succeeding in growth going forward are, are going to need to be creative thinkers and they're going to need to work collaboratively and with agility across teams and, and it may be even businesses as well um, to address these shifts and find innovative new solutions and fundamentally you're just going to need to remain adaptive going forward. Love that. Love that. Jade, your thoughts? I hate to echo Katie again, but it really is the most important to be adaptable. I think we've that's kind of the theme and a lot of what we've discussed today is that it's you need to constantly be hungry to learn uh, and then just take that initiative to learn, whether it be watching podcasts like this or, or going to conferences or just or reading more. Um, and again, even if it's outside of your job description, just that hunger to learn more will help you hone the skills to continue leveling up. Wonderful. Well, Jade, thank you so much. Katie, thank you so much. You've dropped so much knowledge. Really do appreciate it. Peggy and I are going to talk about some more mobile heroes and who are in the news doing cool stuff in a moment. But thank you so much for your time. So Peggy, we had mobile news and we did a deep dive into how some of the most successful people in mobile marketing got where they are. I've achieved what they've achieved and maybe how some others can achieve it as well. But I think you've got some more Mobile Heroes news for us. Who is doing amazing things in the world today? Well, actually, John, in a way, this is a little bit of a twist, right? Because our Mobile Heroes in the news is because you put them there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, kind of. <laughs> I'm talking about this awesome list getting loads of attention because it lists the mobile marketing influencers that matter, right? And no surprise, perhaps a massive number of them are mobile heroes in that list. Eight, count them eight, and probably counting because you are getting a lot of calls, John, to keep building it. So who knows? We'll do a part absolutely, two. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm glad you picked up on this because I worked hard to find mobile influencers. I tried literally 15 different services and these services suck. Uh, BuzzSumo gave me a, a website that was last updated 2018 as most influential on mobile advertising. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I think there's a different list there probably, John. It's like, you know, the, the background agencies that are most effective in Black Hat's SEO to keep this going. <laughs> that is probably it. And also, you know, just people on, who are big on Twitter or maybe hashtag well or something. Yeah. And so I decided to make my own list of influencers and you see it in front of you. Absolutely. Now I want to call them out because you can't see them. We know them because they've either been on our show or we just know them through the mobile heroes. So I want to just count them down and maybe you can tell me a little bit about where you came up with these amazing titles for them as well. So kick it off. Drew Frost, he's been here. He's amazing, right? Leads product growth marketing at Sam's Club, which belongs to Walmart, which is probably why you dubbed him a billion dollar business badass. I had to. I mean, like we talk to amazing people and there's a lot of incredible people in growth marketing and they're often in startups or they're in, you know, 10 to $100 million companies, maybe $100 million plus pretty rare that we're talking to somebody whose company is doing a half a trillion dollars of revenue <laughs> every single year. So you know what? It's hard to be in growth for a startup. It's also hard, maybe even harder. I'm not sure to be in growth for a mega giant. How do you move the needle when you're so big? So we loved Drew. He was amazing. I thought he deserves a lot. He was amazing. He knows a lot. And he's so humble. I mean, his big deal was he's searching for the secret barbecue sauce, you know, so <laughs> more power to him. He's the real deal. Keeping with badass, right? Janie Parasini from DraftKings to EA to Dapper Labs, where she's growing games, NFTs, blockchain, a strong woman with strong opinions and values she stands up for. And what I love here, most badass mobile marketer, period. Clearly, clearly. Now she looks really 
she, she always looks good and she looks really nice in this particular picture here you know with white she's also had some like black and leather and just looking hardcore and everything like that very amazing but what I love about her is the insight that she shares and the fact that she does it so naturally and so well. Mm -hmm. My quintessential Janie moment is having her on a webinar and she's eating. <laughs> and she's delivering great insights, dropping hints, dropping, you know, all this okay. magic. And she's, uh, you know, having a snack as she's on the webinar. I've never had anybody else do that. And it totally worked because she has the chutzpah to pull it off. She is it. She is it. And I love it. I mean, I have some Janie moments. I've talked with her. And what I love it is like, oh, I can't do this, but I've got a really strong woman who can. Why don't you take her instead? And it's like, you know what? That is strength because you've just given me someone that you recommend, but that you're stepping down and stepping back, letting someone, up, someone else come up that ladder, up that rung. Speaking of strong women, I'll stay with a few. You've got strong men too. Um, Rose Ogutsina, she was also here and, you know, marketing manager at Ludia, calls herself on LinkedIn a marketing wizard, and you obviously have, and you agree, and there she is. I totally agree. I love chatting with her. And you know what? You don't have to be super out there and super hyper confident in public just outwardly to be an amazing growth marketer. And I think Rose wowed us both with just, hey, she had a deep knowledge, deep insight, and she was not unafraid to share that and really enjoyed having her. And you know what? You mentioned it. There are a lot of women on this list and I got to thank you and I got to thank others for bringing them up and making sure that you know, they're in the forefront. So it was easy to pick great women for this list. It was, that, that, that's not always been the case. That's true. And another one, Annika Lynn, she and I, we go back a while. She, I remember a conversation, mm, should I have a TED talk? I'm like, Annika, are you kidding, man? You're amazing. <laughs> Lead marketing. So she was, you know, she led marketing at uh, Stash, at Thimble, now at Sable. And what I love about her is, hey, she literally goes that extra mile, right? Because it's about running marathons and in a way, outrunning competitors in more ways yeah. than one, you might say. Uh, you said she was fitter than you. I would say she's even smarter than you, not you, I, I, you in general, but absolutely. I don't recall uh, interviewing Annika or having her on a show where she isn't wearing a tank top and her muscles, <laughs> her gun, the sun's out, gun's out. I guess the sun's always out where Annika is. Um, and, and you know what? You see her fitness equipment in the background in her condo, you know, so it, it, it was cool having her. Uh, great insight. And uh, she's always happy to share it. Now we're going to switch over to really smart men. Thomas Hopkins, you know, we've known him since Masterclass, John. We've done interviews with him before. We followed him from Lyft to Masterclass. Now, no surprise, own growth consultancy, Growth Hop. Mm -hmm. That's when he's got this T-Hop thing going. Exactly. I still remember the interview that we did together with him. He's in his Airstream in his backyard. Um, absolutely love it. You know what? Um, it's pretty amazing when you've been, uh, when you're interviewing people who have experience at all different levels in an in industry, in an organization, and you get insight from bottom, from the top, from all investment side, all that stuff. So really enjoyed Thomas. And I'm watching him. That, that's one to watch, John. Mark my words. Lamit Patel, synonymous with growth, but hey, the AI man, right? With his AI book, which is, which is breaking records. The man, what can I say? He takes growth seriously. Seasoned veteran, someone you need to know. And of course, senior VP growth at Together Labs, formerly IMVU. Can't be a list without him, probably, right, John? Yeah, you, you really can't. I mean, like... <clears throat> Lamet, I uh, just, like I say, he eats challenges for lunch. I mean, he's got, he's been VP marketing in so many different places. He's an investor. Uh, he's got the best selling book. It's a Wall Street Journal best selling book. That's no mean feat. Uh, super interesting dude and great insight as well. And I have to take a little bit of credit here because, again, one time a long time ago, gee, Peggy, a book. You think I can do it? I'm like, are you kidding me, Lamet? Go for it. What should it be? Well, come on. You know, you 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 know, you like AI for breakfast here. So go for it. Um, yeah. And I like that. I like to see people rise and shine. And speaking of rising, Shamant Rao, right? The Rocket Man. What can I say? Not only because his company is Rocket Ship HQ, but 
a lot of experience. Singa in Moby, Fresh Planet, you know, it's all about rocketing growth. So well-deserved place on the list. You know, I first came across Samantha uh, with his podcast, User Acquisition Show, and, and enjoyed it. Uh, got interviewed by him. I think that was on IDFA and SK Ad Network and all that stuff, of course, that we've been dealing with for how long? A decade? Two decades? <laughs> it's been a while, right? Yeah. Um, but I didn't know at the time he has a big background. You mentioned it, Zynga, right? I mean, not small company in mobile gaming. And uh, it's pretty interesting to chat with him as well. And then Andreas Snellman, the director of fraud prevention at Adjust. Now, you gave him one title. I know a different one because I hang out with different circles in Berlin and beyond where they call him the one and the only fraudmeister. <laughs> I like yours. I like yours because like he's German. So he speaks German. So he's a meister. I also call him Friar Tuck. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> look at this beard. He's a monk. Uh, that's relatively new. I didn't have that when I met him in Malta at a conference. Um, mm -hmm. So I called him the wired monk. But, you know, he is pretty impressive. He under he understands deep patterns in oh, yeah. traffic, in marketing activity. And uh, I've enjoyed his insight. Understanding and detecting fraud, that is him. He's gone through the nine different types of fraud with me and counting and all the nuances in between because there's an ABC under each point. So more power to him. And then, of course, there were a couple more. They weren't heroes, but hey, we must be able to pick them, John, because they were on our series. And after 20 episodes, right, 2 episodes as of today, we have some familiar faces. Just want to call them out. High five, of course. Um, and, uh, Hey, there they all are. And I've organized them, not in any particular order. Uh, we had Ophir. He was for now it's digital turbine. It was fiber. Um, we had him on our very first show, actually IDFA problem, yep. no problem. Dean Takahashi, the man, the, the, what do you what call him? Dean, the machine, Dean the machine, Dean the, machine, the, the, the king of 10 story days. Yes. We had Claire was on now at Rovio. Look at that jump and what a short time. More power to you. John Hook we had from Boom Hits and Annie Carvel, of course, the man at Feature, right? Which just expanded into the U.S., right? And they yeah. brought on somebody else that I had on the list as yes. well. Gabe Kuwaki. Yes, Gabe. Gabe. Exactly. From that amazing tome, I would say, the ASO book. If mm -hmm. you haven't seen it, then just try to lift it. <laughs> Because I printed out the PDF once to read it, so I can tell you it is deep, and they are going far. And finally, hey, there's one person here. Maybe we should have him on the show. I have to say congratulations to Matt Sadovsky, moving onward and upward, VP of growth, with a mission to help the leading consumer brands glow, uh, grow rather at LL Catterton. That's a company I did some research, uh, leading consumer first private equity company with $30 billion in assets under management, John. So no small deal here. Wow. Uh, retail, pet care, health, wellness, you know, maybe, maybe one for your list as well when you do part two. Who knows? Could be, could be, you know what? Could be growing, could be glowing. I mean, he kind of looks glowing there with, you know, light coming off of him. Uh, that's awesome. I look forward to meeting him. I do not know him, so that looks cool. Well, we have to have him. I, I remember it was years ago. He was building um, AI systems for like fun, right? And I remember one time, it must have been five years ago or, or so, and he said, there is no UA without AI. <laughs> I, he was the head of his time. I leave you with that thought. So wow. I mean, yeah. he was ahead of his time. And you know what, Peg, it is really appropriate that we ended this particular show with kind of a smorgasbord of mobile heroes and mobile luminaries because the whole show was about leveling up. The whole show was about how did you get where you are, asking mm -hmm. some really successful people and sharing those insights for others. So hopefully that's super helpful and hopefully everybody has massively enjoyed this show. I know I have. I think mm -hmm. you have too, Peggy. Oh, I have really. It's been like looking back on all these gems and then you think, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, it's because they're also on the show with us. So that gives us another reason to say, hey, you know, if you're watching, if you're tuning in, if you're listening, if you fit the bill, get in touch because maybe this is where mobile heroes are born, are forged. 
Never know. In the fires of yeah. Bubble Heroes Uncensored. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But hey, uh, that is a great point. If you are a mobile hero, maybe you're a mobile hero in the making. Maybe you're an undiscovered mobile hero. Let's discover you. It'd be awesome to chat. So reach out to Peggy. I mean, you can find her maybe a couple of places, you know, I don't know. She, you sung there. Really next, John. <laughs> exactly. You know, maybe she's on Twitter. I don't know. It's kind of newfangled, you know, but pretty sure she's on LinkedIn, you know, a few other places around the world and me too. So, hey, reach out, let us know. And thank you for listening and or watching. Have a wonderful day.